Starting here in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, that's where the story begins. This is Mary of Bethany is uh, a, a good way to describe her. There's many Marys in the Bible, and so it's good to identify who they are. And this one is identified as Mary uh, with Mary and Martha. That's a good way to uh, know who she is. Also, she's also known as Mary of Bethany. This is Mary the saint, and she is oftentimes confused or also thought to be the woman that was a sinner that also anointed the feet of Jesus with this precious ointment and wiped, it, wiped her, his feet with her hair. But Mary and Martha, Mary is the, is the saint. She is not the sinner woman. The sinner woman isn't even named. But for some reason, she gets confused because they both have a similar story. Both of them did anoint the feet of Jesus. Both of them wiped the, his feet with their hair. It was a, uh, an attitude of worship or an act of worship. But what that tells me is that whether we are a saint or a sinner, that we can pour out our love to the Lord, and he accepts that. So it doesn't matter where we've come from, where, what we have done, where we have been, that this love is... When it is poured out in this adoration of worship and just a sincere heart, it's received. Jesus receives this, um, this act of worship, us pouring out our lives before him, pouring out our love. The sinner woman, Jesus said to her um, when she was also ridiculed for anointing the feet of Jesus from the, the disciples and those that were around that table that night. But Jesus said to her, she who has sinned much has been forgiven much, and she loves much. So because she was such a tremendous sinner, because she was so bad, um, there was a great sense of being forgiven. And because she was forgiven for much, she loved much. That's the sinner woman that anointed the feet of Jesus. That is not Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany's anointing of the feet of Jesus was an act of um, honor, and it was an act to prepare Jesus for his burial. And Mary is not among those women that went to anoint the body of Jesus after he died because she understood that he would raise again as he had been teaching for the last several years. Mary is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. They were brothers and sisters. They lived together. They were wealthy. They had a... um, they lived in an affluent area of Bethany. Their home was used for the ministry. They even had an upper room, as I've read through the commentaries and the different research. That And you know what happens in the upper room. They were prayer warriors. They were devoted disciples of the Lord. In fact, it does say that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. We can identify with both Mary and Martha. We long to be Mary in our devotion to the Lord and our loyalty to him. She was so devoted, devoted so completely, so loyal in her perception of the word of God. When, the, when she understood what the Lord um, taught and she perceived she had tremendous spiritual perception in the things of God, how to deal with people, what to, you know, how to build relationships, it went all through her entire life. She was a people person, as as her sister was. They did a lot of entertaining in their home. They did a lot of ministering. A lot of ministering went on in their home. They had wonderful friends, many, many friends, and um, just a lot of beautiful relationships. And she knew how to build relationships in a godly manner. She was sensitive to the things of God, and she projected those things onto people. We long to be well-balanced and have a disciplined life, as Mary did. We long to be yielded as Mary was yielded. There was a yieldedness about her. As far as her character or her personality was concerned, she was like one of these women that are cool, calm, and collected, you know, in in all kinds of situations and circumstances. That was just her disposition. Martha was more of a woman of, you know, impulse and kind of like, a, if we could describe it today, an in-your-face type of woman. You know, she's just going to get her point across. Uh, Mary, probably a little bit more subdued, a little more calm, collected, you know, cool about things. But it doesn't mean that she was any less powerful or, or of an, a great influence. That, just, that was just their personalities. Mary had tongue control. Mm, how we long. 
Someone tie this tongue. Someone deliver me from what this tongue can say. She knew when to speak and when not to speak. And what we have recorded in the word for us is that there were some situations where she did not speak and others in which she did. She had something to say. It's an awesome example. She is an awesome example of how actions speak louder than words. We learn more from Mary's actions than from the words that she spoke. And that she was a woman of action, but her actions meant something. They did something in people's lives. And Jesus honored her, and he commended her because she had right actions. But the reality, even though we long to be Mary's, the reality is that it's much easier to be a Martha. I guess because she's just so me, busy, distracted, stressed out, fretting, complaining, murmuring, whining, those kinds of things. It's just easier to be a Martha. But Martha, at least we know that she wasn't, you know, in sin. She just simply got a little sidetracked. Martha teaches us to make wise decisions. She uh, teaches us to keep the proper priorities and to have a good attitude. And that's a lot to teach us, isn't it? Mary teaches us the secret of stillness. This is a a lost, lost art in our society today. In other words, she, if she were here today, she would say, ladies, slow down. Just slow down. Calm down in many ways. Rid your life of clutter. That is the secret of, of stillness, to rid your life of clutter. There's so many things. Just open your closet and see all the clutter. Well, think about your life. What kind of clutter is there that really needs to just go or be reorganized or let go of? Just ridding our lives of of clutter. That's what she teaches us. She teaches us how to cultivate a quiet heart. This is so valuable because we live in such a stressed-filled world where we are so easily distracted. Oh, it doesn't take much. You sit down to have a quiet time and a fly comes buzzing around and I mean you are some, you're in some other world or you're, I don't know, it just, it just distracts you. I had gotten an inspiration, one of these terrific inspirations to, to make some curtains. And uh, now I've had this material, of course, for quite some time, but not inspired. You know, I have to be in the mood to sew. I love to sew, but I have to be in the mood to do so. And so I, last week, I got this inspiration and I was going to sew my curtains. Well, that's all I could think about was, you know, what style were they going to be? How was I going to do? What I was, like, was I going to use a pattern? Was I just going to use my own, you know, imagination? And, you know, I had my material. I got the scissors out. I cleared off the table, you know, and then got the ironing board out. And the machine is up and the whole bit. And I am like into these curtains. I love, I just, I love to sew. It's just therapy for me. But the problem was, Last weekend, I was doing a retreat for Calvary Chapel Downey, and also I needed to prepare this message. So I had these messages that I needed to prepare. But every time I sat down to prepare the messages, what popped up in my mind was how I was going to sew my curtains. And I thought to myself as I sat in front of that computer saying, oh, please, Lord, help me to concentrate. Because all I could concentrate on was sewing my curtains. Because that's so much more fun. You know, you can, you, you know, it's, it's energetic. I don't know. But when you sit and try to hear the voice of the Lord, that takes a little bit more mm, sit there and listen. So it, I was, so, it's, I just thought, you know what? I'm Martha. I am so easily distracted. It doesn't take much. A little project, a little, you know, inspiration distracting me from what the Lord would have me to do. Well, I, you know, we got a message, so don't worry. <laughs> We are to take time to be holy. That's what she teaches us. But we must take that time from other things. You're not going to just get time. You've got to make time. That is what she teaches us. We must schedule it in to be sure that we do have a good, quiet time, one that is not so distracted, where you just schedule out a little time to meet with the Lord. Mary is mentioned three times in Scripture. Each time we find her at the feet of Jesus... Each time she is at the feet of Jesus, she is surrounded by fragrance. We see her here in Luke where she sat at the feet of Jesus waiting for his word of instruction and the smell of good food as Mary is clanging the pans and getting that good elaborate meal prepared for Jesus and everyone that was with him. And so there she sat with just the aroma of 
of good food just permeating the house. It was a pleasant thing. We see that she, in John chapter 11, that she fell at his feet weeping. She was casting her cares, her sorrow, her grief at the feet of Jesus and there around the aroma or the odor of death because her brother Lazarus had died. The next time we see her is she knelt at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him, and that is where she just surrendered all to Jesus when she broke open that alabaster box of ointment and she anointed his head, she anointed his feet for the day of his burial. That's what he said. And the result of that was that the whole place was filled with the lovely scent of this perfume of the spikenard that she had anointed him with. Not only John tells the story of Mary anointing the feet of Jesus, breaking open the alabaster box of ointment, but also Mark tells us another version of it, and so does Matthew. So this, this story of her anointing the feet of Jesus with this expensive uh, perfume is recorded in two other Gospels besides the Gospel of John. Remember now that the occasion in which Mary anointed the feet of Jesus was in celebration of Lazarus rising from the dead. And that was what the party was all about. So there was a lot of people, and uh, there was a big crowd, and she was moved to anoint the feet of Jesus, and he, he honored her for that. So as I look at Mary's life, I see, that, I see Mary waiting, I see Mary weeping, and I see Mary worshiping. When we apply these three principles to our lives, this is a life that, uh, of victory. This is how we walk in victory. When we know when to wait, and we know what to do with our sorrows, and we know how to worship, all surrounded at the feet of Jesus. It just, uh, this is a woman who really understood the presence of Jesus with her 24-7. He was with her at all times. And so what a powerful lesson that is. When I I need to know, when I need an instruction from the Lord, I need guidance or I need a decision to be made, and I know that it's time for me to wait upon him. And then I know what to do with my sorrows and the questions that I have. In my times of weeping, in my times of devastation, I fall at his feet and, and I get a word. And then to worship, just to pour out my life to give to him all that is precious to me. What a powerful combination. When I understand those things, there's not a need in my life that does not present itself at the feet of Jesus. And the result of that is victory, to walk in victory. That's, I think, the greatest thing that Mary teaches us. Well, let's look at Mary waiting. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, and I just love this story. Every time I read it, I seem to get something else out of it. Even though it's a very common story, we probably could quote it by heart by this time. Um, But yet there's such depth in it. It goes on to say in verse 38, Now it came to pass as they went that he, Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, which also... I love that word because Mary also sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word, implying that Martha sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha also understood and had spiritual perception. She had understanding. This word heard, as Mary would sit here, she sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word means to comprehend. It means to understand. It means that she opened her heart and she welcomed every single word that the Lord Jesus spoke. Not a word did she allow to fall to the ground. Is that how important the word of God is to to us? Do we take it all? Do we thirst and hunger after it? Are we at a place where we're not satisfied until we just feast upon the word of God? That understanding, that comprehension, welcoming it into our heart, um, she, li- she just lived on every word. It means to ponder. The things that he said, she pondered these things. She knew what to keep in her heart for herself and what to share with others. Just an awesome, awesome spiritual insight. She had ears to hear. I love that. It's a work of the Spirit. Deep spiritual understanding of the things of God. She was moved and, and, and um, motivated by the Spirit of God. But Martha, verse 40, 
was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered her and said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You'll notice here that it says, Bid her, therefore, that she would help me. That was Martha's request of the Lord. Mary now becomes the object of blame. Martha's distraction is because Mary is not doing what Martha thinks Mary should be doing. Lord, tell her to help me. Now remember, they're wealthy. They have substance. They have money. They have servants. She had plenty of of help. But why was her attention on Mary? Mary becomes the object of blame. And yet Mary is doing exactly what she is supposed to be doing. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary's work is done. Mary isn't lazy or some kind of a, a mystic, in a sense, that all she does is sit there and gaze into the eyes of Jesus. Her work is done. And so she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I, what is amazing to me is that Mary doesn't say a word here. This is not the time when she speaks or says anything. She says nothing. Are you being blamed for something that is beyond your control? Are you paying for something that you didn't cause? Are you the object of blame or reproach or um, criticism or judgment because of things that are out of your control? or beyond your control, something that you didn't cause it. You had nothing to do with it, but there you are. You're being blamed or made to pay for something that has gone wrong, a relationship that isn't doing as well as it should, but it's your fault, but yet is it really your fault? Was it you that that brought the um, discord? Was it you that brought the division? Oftentimes it's not, and there you are in a place of, of blame. Are you distracted? by one person who is not doing what you think he or she should be doing. Oh, how we get caught in this. How we look at people, and because they are not doing what I think they should be doing, we get distracted. All we can concentrate on, all we can see is what this person isn't doing that I think they should be doing or not doing what I think that they should be doing. Are you distracted? Are you um, distracted by somebody? Is your eyes on a person? And are they dictating to you your mood and your attitude or even your ability to serve the Lord? Do you know how people can get you so distracted? Or a, uh, a circumstance? Because you are the object of blame. Now is that circumstance dictating to you how you will act, how you will love, how you will serve the Lord? Is it having anything to do with with your mood or your attitude? Are you getting down because of that? Is Is it controlling your life rather than the Spirit of God? Jesus rebukes Martha for being distracted. And he rebukes you and I tonight if that's where we are. If someone is, if our eyes are on a person because they are not doing what we think they should be doing, and we're so focused on that that it's it's distracting us from what the Lord has called us to do, then we need a rebuke. We cannot allow circumstances and people, especially, to distract us from the things that God has called us to do or to take us out of the work because we're just so inhabilitated. We just just are unable to function. That ought not to be. And some of us need a stern rebuke. Get your eyes off of that person. Get your eyes off the situation. Whether that person is doing something right or whether that person is doing something wrong, God is going to use it in your life to either pray for them, go into more intercession for that person. If you think that person is in such trouble or they're causing you such grief, then it's a time to commit them unto the Lord. Not to be full of care, but to cast our care upon the Lord. That's what Jesus said. Martha, you are so full of care. You're so full of, of of the care that you're, you're being distracted by what I've called you to do. 
or to take that care and turn it into a prayer. On the other hand, he commends Mary for waiting, for sitting at his feet, for hearing his instruction, for getting direction. It says that Mary chose the better part. He said, Jesus said, one thing is needful. One thing is necessary or essential. And there are times when doing nothing demands greater strength than if we would act on it. Sometimes to be quiet requires such a work of God's spirit than for us to open our mouth and say exactly what we think about the thing or how I really feel about this. And so we see Mary being yielded and constrained by the love of Christ. Great constraint that Mary did not respond to Martha's accusation. Where we really trust that when we are unjustly accused or mistreated or blamed for something that is out of our control, that we can leave the revenge or the defending of ourselves to God takes a tremendous amount of strength. Strength beyond us. It's the strength of God's Spirit. When we are faced with a situation that is not fair, where we are being criticized or misunderstood, misrepresented, my response should be, and this is what Mary did, a voiceless, confident calmness because she honestly believed that Jesus would speak for her. See, she knew when to speak and when not to speak. She knew when to act and when not to act. And her actions in this story speak volumes to me. This love of Christ that constrains us, this is a, um, it means a spontaneous expression of love from the heart without limit. That means there's no conditions and there's no strings attached to my loving others or loving in a certain circumstance or situation. But on the other hand, it means the ability to withhold what people deserve. That is the complete work of God's spirit in the life of a woman. Mary teaches this. Mary's care, all she cared about, she only cared about one thing, and that was her loyalty to the Lord Jesus. Now, to be involved in his work, there was great rewards to be involved in his work. That's awesome. And that's rewarding, and that is satisfying, and that's fulfilling. To be an instrument in the hand of God, to be able to teach others lessons, to be able to counsel others, to be able to lead others, to be able to impart wisdom upon others is just an awesome thing, to be able to be used by God in these ways. And Mary was used by God in a tremendous way, but what was even better, what she longed for and what she gained most satisfaction from was when he smiled at her. And when she gazed into his face, because remember now, she, we see him in the spirit, but she saw him in the physical. And the most important thing, all she wanted was that she, she would see that smile on his face, meaning approval. You've done well, Mary. You've done the right thing. You've chosen the better part. You chose not to respond when you had all the freedom to respond, and maybe you would be justified in that response, but would it be the best? Would it be the thing that God would have us to do? Or would the Lord say, tongue control? See, Mary, Mary's outstanding. It's more than her just being this mystical type of a woman that just sat at the feet of Jesus and gazed at him all day. This was a woman of action. This was a woman of influence. This is a woman with a big heart. She was sensitive to the needs of those around her. She was not afraid to bring out a rebuke when a rebuke was needed. She was not afraid to correct when a correction was needed. But it was all through the love of Christ that constrained her. Without limit, but yet knowing when to withhold. That's a powerful, powerful combination. This is a woman that walks in victory. All I care about is that no matter what I do, that I would gain a smile from my Jesus, that he would look upon our lives and that smile would say to me, well done, good and faithful servant, you passed the test. And when he frowns, I frown too. But I'm going to take it like Martha. I'm going to be a woman and and take it. If I need correction, I'm going to take it. Because remember, Martha grew from this correction. 
Mary chose to cultivate a quiet heart, and Jesus says this cannot be taken from her. This is something that, that not the world, not the uh, grossness of our society, whether they love God or don't love God, no matter what is around us, no matter how immoral this nation becomes, nothing can take away this cultivating a quiet heart, a heart after God. These are things that the world cannot touch. So it doesn't matter how chaotic my situation becomes, how hectic or how terrible things are personally or nationally or worldly. Jesus says that he has given us a peace that the world cannot take away, that the world cannot give. It's the peace of God. And this is what rules our hearts and our minds. This is what directs us and guides us to have his peace. That's what we long for. That's what we yearn for. That's what we depend upon. The world can't take that away from us, and we, it can't give it to us. Only Jesus can give us this peace. When we get an attitude, or we are cumbered about, they're just, we're stressed. We're just busy and fretting and, and fuming and complaining and murmuring and whining and all those things that come along with just being cumbered about with many things. When we are troubled or we begin to worry, then it is time for us to sit at the feet of Jesus. To wait, that's so hard for us. To seek, to seek his mind, to wait until we are absolutely sure that this is his direction. This is his will. This is his way. And if that takes years, we're not going to move until we are absolutely sure this is the Lord. We're going to wait until we know his mind in the matter. To choose the better over the good. There's many good and noble things that we can get involved in. There's a lot of uh, crusades and things that are out there to occupy our time and to take our attention, to uh, deplete us of our giftings. But are they the best? Have we inquired of the Lord that which is better and not just good? You see, Martha chose that which was good, but Jesus said that Mary chose the better part. There is a difference between God's better over the good. It is time to consider when I am getting an attitude, when I am getting worried about something, when things are overwhelming and I don't know the answers to things, am I carrying a burden that God never intended me to carry? I need to ask myself, did God ask me to carry this burden or am I supposed to be casting this care upon him, this burden? Let him carry it. Because he said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And if it's not light, I think I'm taking on too much. I'm worrying too much. And I need to give it to the Lord again and again and again. Am I trying to make it work? I'm going to push open doors. I'm going to make this thing work. It's a good cause. It's a good thing. And I am so determined. I want this so bad. I'm going to make it work. Are we making things work? Have we inquired of the Lord? Have we asked him, seriously sought him, and asked him, is this what you would have me to do? Is it okay? Have you gotten God's okay? Has the Lord Jesus said, yes, this is what I want you to do? Is it God's best for me, for you? Have you asked him, is this what you want? It might be a good and noble cause. It might be a good deed, but is it God's best for you? Would you be in his perfect will? That's what Mary teaches us. Weeping, Mary weeping. Look at John chapter 11, verse 28. This, remember now, is the story about Lazarus, their brother, had gotten sick. Mary and Martha had sent a message to Jesus to come quickly because him whom you love is very, very sick. And they knew that Jesus could heal him, but he was so sick they were afraid that he would die. And Jesus deliberately waited to come. He delayed his coming. And then Martha runs out to meet him, and she said to him, Lord, if you would have only been here, then my brother would not have died. You're too late, Lord. Why couldn't you have come when we asked? If you would have come when we asked, this wouldn't have happened. And then Jesus gave her the greatest revelation of the New Testament. And he said to her, Martha, You're looking at the resurrection and the life. That in Jesus is life. He is creator. 
He creates life. He maintains life, but he also takes life. And, and, this is, um, and then Martha's response was, I believe this. She got a revelation. Oh, I realize who you are. And when she realized who Jesus was, it's like everything else didn't matter anymore. She didn't think about the fact that he wasn't there and allowed her brother to die. And we pick up the story in verse 28, and it says, And when she had said so, this is Martha saying, Jesus said, Do you believe I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that I can, cre- I can perform a miracle? Do you believe that I will do what is best for you? And she said emphatically, Yes, Lord, I believe that no matter what you do, it's best for me. And so in response to that, this is after she, she responded and confessed um, this tremendous confession of faith. After she had received this comfort and assurance that Jesus would make the situation better, she didn't know how, but she knew he would, that he would do above and beyond what she could ever imagine or think. It goes on to say that she went her way. Nothing has happened now. Lazarus is still in the grave. He's been buried. He died, and they buried him, but she went her way. But she's uplifted. There is hope is restored. There's life back into her. And she went her way, and notice what she does. And she called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come, and he calls for thee. Now, this is tremendous victory in Martha's life, because now she's including Mary. Before, it was Mary's fault that she was distracted, remember? But now the first thing that she does is she goes and she says, Mary, the Master calls for you. Now, what we're seeing here is these personalities. Martha is doing exactly what any Martha would do. A woman of impulse runs out there as soon as she hears Jesus is coming, and she is like in his face saying, why weren't you here if you would have, if you would have only been here? And Jesus responds to her according to her personality, where Mary is doing just what she, she was always doing. She was in the home, quietly waiting, praying, interceding, whatever. She was just doing what Mary would do. And she is called. And Jesus says, tell her to come. So the master calls for you. In verse 32, then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, what does she do? She fell at his feet saying, Lord. Now she asked the exact same question Martha does. Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. They are so Sorrowful, They're just overcome with the death of their brother. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, she had many friends. They were loved by all kinds of people. There was a big ministry that this little family did. And the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. That means that he, his heart ached. He agonized in his heart, but no sound was made. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And that has to be the most tremendous verse in the entire Bible because what that tells us is that Jesus hurts when we hurt. You see, he he knows how um, how to have compassion on our on our human frailty, that grieving. It tells us that God cares. That he meets us in our place of need. And not only does he meet us in our place of need, but he soothes our pain as only he can. This comfort that only God can comfort us with. And then we take that comfort and we comfort others. Then Jesus responds to this this whole questioning. He responds by performing the greatest miracle of his entire life the one that actually took him to the cross, and that was the raising of Lazarus. Now, keep in mind that when Mary and Martha sent for Jesus to come, that's all they said, Jesus, come, because him who you love is very ill. He's very sick, like sick unto death type of a sickness. All they said to him was come. They didn't tell Jesus what to do. What a secret that is. What an insight to our troubles and to our griefs and our sorrows and our pain, that we don't tell Jesus how to fix it. We just say to him, come, because they had the confidence that no matter what he would do, it would be wonderful. Now, they had no idea that he was going to raise their brother from the dead. Because remember what, what Martha's response to Jesus was when he said, take away the stone? 
And Martha says, oh, no, Lord, he stinketh. He's been in there for four days. You, you can't take away that stone. They had no idea. They just knew deep down in their heart that he was going to do something wonderful. And the result of that is in verse 45. Then many of the Jews, which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, notice, believed on him. You see, through our sorrows, through our trials, through our devastating circumstances, comes new life. Many believed. What a testimony. I look at this word that Jesus said. He said, where have you laid him? And I think of any that is hurting today, that he's asking that same question. But I must know that he is before me, he's behind me, he's beside me, he's beneath me, he's above me. When we are hurting, it seems as though the Lord is the nearest, or else we're just more tuned in to him being, we're just more conscious of him being so close. It's like he puts us in a bubble. And we have this assurance, although we can't ease our own pain, only he can do that, that he's going to get us through. Can you hear Jesus saying to you today, where does it hurt? That's what he was saying. Where have you laid him? Where does it hurt? Where did you lay him or her or it? Where did you lay that broken relationship? Where did you lay that shattered dream? That's what he's asking us tonight. Can we respond to him and say, as did they, Lord, come and see? Expecting him to perform a miracle. Not telling him what to do, just knowing down deep in my heart that no matter what it is that is causing me so much grief, maybe some distraction, is something I cannot fix. They could not fix their brother. He had already died. But come and see what we, where we put him. Lord, come and see. Look at my shattered dream. And I know that no matter what you do, it will be right for me. And that you will do above and beyond what I could ever imagine or think. Is anything hopeless for the daughter of God? But we bring this thing that we think is hopeless. And we say, Jesus, come and see where I've lost hope. Come and see the thing that has caused me so much pain. This relationship that I wanted so much more out of, it is so disappointing to me. It hurts me so much to know that it is far less than what I ever thought it would be. Come and see. Just come and see, because I know if you would just come and see that you'll make it better. You'll make sense out of it. You'll do what is best for me. But I'm not going to tell you how to fix it. And I'm not going to tell you when to fix it or to fix it within a certain amount of time. But I'm going to know that you're going to to give me the strength to see it through. And if I would just watch you work, I'm going to see a miracle. I'm going to see something dead rise and live again. Now, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. That's what she teaches us. And why? Why, why would I come to this place? Why would I give so much of my pain and my grief and my unanswered questions and my broken relationships and my, my disappointments and my shattered dreams? Why would I want him to do something with it? Because I want many to believe that when they see a miracle happen in my life and I give honor to God and I give him the acknowledgement, this is him, I couldn't have fixed it, I couldn't have made it better, I, I just... I just gave up on it, in fact. I didn't breathe hope into this situation. This was a work of God in me. Many will believe as a result of that. Is that just awesome or what? And then Mary pours out her worship. And in pouring out her worship, and I just say this about that, all he says is come. I love that word. I don't have to be anything. I don't have to bring hope into something that I have no hope in. I don't have to pretend I'm... I'm something that I'm not. I'm just so honest with the Lord. I just come and I pour out my offering, my life, my trials, my brokenness, whatever. And I give it to him, all that I am, all that I have, and all that I don't have. And some way, somehow, the sweet fragrance of Jesus 
comes permeating out of my life because he is in it. He will do above and beyond what I can ever imagine or think. He will do the miracle that is right for me. I just have to come, and like Martha, I have to believe. And he says to us today, do you believe I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that I can perform a miracle for you? Not everybody else, you. And we have to say emphatically, yes, Lord, I believe. And then he says, then come, offer it to me, and and watch what I will do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. Father, for some of us, it was the rebuke tonight. For others, we're commended for doing what we what you want us to do, but all in all, you bring us to a place in order that we might be women of honor. Lord, you would honor us because of pure obedience, not because we're all together or because our lives are perfect, but simply because we just fall at your feet. Some of us were weeping, some of us worshiping, some of us are waiting, but nevertheless, we know that at your feet, are the answers. And at your feet, you will do above and beyond what we could ever imagine or think. So what else can we do but to lay our lives down? Take us, Lord Jesus, because we are yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.